uh, very early on, I had a, a school, we had a dinner at school, and the guest speaker was a guy called Frederick Forsyth. He was a famous author at the time. He'd written a book called Day of the Jackal, another one called The Odessa Files. He was kind of like the Dan Brown of his generation. And he was, and the other guy, the boy sitting on the other side of him was really boring, and he didn't want to talk to him. So he just basically talked to me for two hours. It was, it was just one of those great moments you have. And at the end, he said, you know, the end he said, make sure you always listen. It doesn't matter who you're talking to, always listen, because you never know where the next great idea comes from, where the next opportunity comes from. And that's very much been the way of my life. Hi, it's Matt Preston, and I'm on Legends with Bevo. This is Legends with Bevo. Thanks to Bet Odyssey, Renelec Electrical Services, and Anytime Fitness Glenelg. And now, here's your host, Bevo. The one and only Matt Preston, great to have you on Legends with Bevo for a chat. Now, you're the best-selling author of seven cookbooks, hopefully it's soon to be the eighth with your new book, The World of Flavour. How are you going over there in Melbourne? And now uh, tell us about the book. It's a, li- it's a little bit grey, which is um, which is annoying because I, w- I, w- I thought today was going to be the, the afternoon for doing nothing. So I, I worked, my, worked my tush off yesterday and um, and now I'm sitting here going, I can't I can't sit out in the sun and, and have a cup of tea. But uh, no, other than that, it's good. I mean, we're... You know, after 250 days of lockdown, any ability to get out is fantastic. And we're still a bit nervous down here, I think. You know, I went out the other day, went out to a rooftop bar in the city, which is fantastic. I had 28, 28 of my closest friends. And it was just really lovely to be able to stand in someone that's really familiar, look around and see all these people you know. And you go, where am I going to go next? It's a bit like a kid in the candy store. I don't, I don't want to <laughs> talk over there. What am I going to do? So, yeah, but very quickly got over that. That what am I going to say, which I think was a... The, the nervousness of a lot of people who'd done not a lot other than, you know, uh, crochet ear pod covers and make sourdough for 250 days. <laughs> it was like, you know, we, we had to find a whole new selection of conversation to have. And plenty of Zooms, I can imagine as well, no doubt. Oh, and just bloody Zooms, yeah. No, <laughs> I, and, and, still, and, and, and still continuing. I mean, I, I, I hate the... You see, look at where you are. Your studio looks great. You know, you've got the big screen up there. You made an effort. Thank I hate you. this kind of, this thing with Zoom. It started off and people were all excited and, you know, um, sales of male makeup boomed in the USA. You know, people people started to acknowledge that maybe they needed a bit of a ring light that would make everything look better. <laughs> and then, then no one actually bought the ring light for 17 bucks in Kmart. And then people just... <laughs> started to do those terrible, bland backgrounds. And part of the joy about a Zoom was being able to look in the background and go, what's that? Is that a guitar in the background? What's going on there? <laughs> oh, is, what, what are the disco lights? Or what are they reading at the moment? Or really, they've still got that book on the shelves. I mean, I, I used to, that, that, that's a great, that's a great, that's a great door, joy. And I, I think it also changes the way you have meetings, doesn't it? You know, Zoom, Zoom became all about say, say one, th- get in, get out, say one thing. That's then the rest of the time was just, just listen. It's not the, not the meetings I love, where you kind of everyone has a has a has a fair rant, and you get that that lovely kind of conversations that that kind of uh, circulate and and kind of the ideas uh, kind of whirlwind up into something quite spectacular. Now we better move on to our very first segment, Matt. This one's called Big Failures and What You've Learned. Do you remember the first big fail you experienced? How did that make you feel? And how did you get past those failures, Matt? I, I mean, you know, it's it's weird in terms of. In terms of failures, I didn't. I didn't. Things like losing footy matches didn't didn't really register. I think the first really big fail I have, and which is specifically food related, was I thought it'd be really clever to have everyone for dinner, and I would dye the mashed potato blue, and I would dye the, and I'd put lots of red food coloring in the baked beans, and I would try and make it a really bright colored dish. And even though it didn't change the flavor at all, people just went, nothing got eaten. No one ate the mashed potato. No one ate the beans. And and that that was a, one of those moments where you go, oh, that's a bit disappointing. I, you know, I've blown my, my 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 weekly budget for my, my my weekly student budget on this meal, and I've just balls it up totally. I think in terms of I think in terms of the other one, very very early on, I was I was shortlisted to present a TV show in the UK called O One for London, and I was I got down to the last the last three or four people to present it. It was it was really exciting, and I I. I went into the studio. I was chronically underprepared. Um, I had to do a, a, a film review. I sat there. There was a little monitor in the corner of the room, like a tiny version of what you've got now. And I remember, I remember that I started and I couldn't get a word out. It was awful. There's a very famous movie called Broadcast News or Network, 
one of those two where Albert Brooks it fills it gets to fill in for the nighttime the nighttime news part, new broadcast and he, he it all goes horribly wrong and he can't remember what he's saying he mumbles his words and he starts sweating and I could see myself I could see the monitor in the corner of my eye I could see myself corpsing I could see myself getting worse and worse and the and the, the producer who was working with me you know filming this for the for the interview was being nicer and nicer because he could see I was totally wrong and it was just that moment you just want to throw your hands up and go and go no uh, I mean uh, uh, there was a little bit of there was a little bit of of, of kind of reassurance when the, the person who beat me for the interview was um Mike Myers who went on to create Austin Powers. So I kind of uh, even though I knew that I was never going to get it anyway, <laughs> it was still that moment of it was still that moment of of I don't ever want to be in that situation of being so totally unprepared that uh, that, that that I'm gonna that I'm gonna not be able to answer the question, not be able to deliver. So I, I historically I'm I'm awfully over prepared for stuff I, I try and you know i try and make the effort to which is not very you know I'm, I'm not i can fly by the seat of my pants but i'm much i'm much better doing that knowing that i've got a ground bed of research and knowledge underneath me it's a great way to be for sure now this this next segment matt is called when the going gets tough the tough gets winning. What was the first big success you ever felt? Like back when you were a kid, say, you know, do you think that set you on a path as well as a professional food I want, critic? I want, I want 50 cents. I want 50 <laughs> cents for, for taking out the Hood History Prize at school. I wrote something about submarines, which I think was probably largely stolen from one of my dad's um, books on submarines. <laughs> and, I, and, I won the, and, and I won the Hood History Prize, and it was very exciting. And, and the, the, even though the 50 cents was, even back then, the 50 cents was nothing, it still felt very good. It still felt very, very good. So I think that, 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 that's, one, that's one of the, that's probably the first, I think. I think I think that that's probably the first that that registered. And I can remember, you know, the, the other stuff I'd won. I remember remember the the walking up and winning it, but I don't remember any emotional afterwards. But that that one, it was like yes. So that that may well have had a an impact now when I come to you know not just writing a recipe book, but also including the history of dishes and, the, and some food history in there. I'm thinking of the Hood History Prize from forty, oh, it'd be forty. 44 years ago, 43 years ago. And do you think that sort of set you on the path as well of becoming a food critic and a judge on MasterChef no, for 10 years? No, no, no not at all. <laughs> no, I think that I think that's I think that's what's so funny about that's what's so funny about life. And that you know, I was very uh, very early on. I had a, a school. We had a dinner at school, and the guest speaker was a guy called Frederick Forsyth. He was a famous author at the time. He'd written a book called Day of the Jackal. Another one called The Odessa Files. He was kind of like the Dan Brown of his generation. And he was, and the other guy, the boy sitting on the other side of him was really boring and he didn't want to talk to him. So he just basically talked to me for two hours. And it was, it was just one of those great moments you have. And at the end, he said, at the end, he said, make sure you always listen. It doesn't matter who you're talking to, always listen because you never know where the next great idea comes from, where the next opportunity comes from. And that's very much been the way of my life, you know. I started as a food writer because I'm, um, because a friend who's starting a new magazine needed someone to write about food and knew I cooked a bit and, and just rang and, and asked me, off, gave, gave me that opportunity. It's a true Cinderella moment. When it came to MasterChef, I was rung for advice on who to cast by, by a, the daughter of a friend of my mum's. You know, this is how, you know, this is how uh, tangential it was. They were just looking for, the, the MasterChef really was going to be two, two chefs and a host. And, and, they, and I, you know, gave the time listen to this woman, you know, asking me, basically plundering my information, using me as an unpaid research research tool, because I've worked for the Melbourne Food and Wine Festival for a few years, so I've done a lot of demos with the chefs. And then halfway through the, the, the conversation, about 40 minutes in, she asked for a photo, and the and the photo went from her to the producer, to the, the head guy at 10, and they, they wrote another role for me in the show. So suddenly there were there were three judges, not two. So again, that that, that thing of, you know, What's that great line? Listen, because opportunity knocks quietly. That's, that's I love I love that, and I'm a bit the same as yourself. I'm being actually told I'm a really good listener, and I suppose you sort of have to be to, to be good good at doing interviews as well, Matt. And so that's really good advice. Now we'll move on to the next segment. This one's called "Now I'm in the Big Time." Now looking back now, when you first started out as a chef, what was it like, and and what was your fondest memory as a chef? Well, I think I think that's the whole thing. Is that I'm not a chef. I'm a I'm a food writer. I'm a I'm a keen home cook. Um, that, that's where I 
that, that that's where I come from. That's my difference, and I think it's probably the difference in 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 the tone of my cookbooks is I'm I'm sitting there thinking about things like who's going to do the washing up and how many pots we're going to use and <laughs> can we make this quicker and you know and and can we get and can we get the you know chefs are involved in in maximum effort for maximum flavor and I'm involved on my whole my whole motto is you know is taken from Antonio Coluccio the moth moth which is which is a minimum fuss maximum flavor so I think that's I think that that's a big difference between a home cook and a and a chef um you know I've cooked a lot I've written a lot of recipes writing recipes for over 20 years I won I made a third recipe feature I won 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 the big Australian recipe writing award so so I've had some I've had some good success with writing recipes and I love it, but but as a cook, it, it never, it didn't, it sort of, it came upon me. You know, like I said, uh, you know, someone said, you want to review restaurants? And then from that, I started writing for The Age. And then someone said, uh, I wanted to do a, I've been baking some biscuits and I took someone to the office for a meeting. They said, you want to write a, a feature on biscuits? So I wrote a cover feature on biscuits then wrote one on jam, that won the award. So, you know, it's, it, 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 I think you, I think often you the same thing, you know. You, you listen, you listen, and you you listen. You're enthusiastic, and things tend to things often tend to open up for you. Then, uh, so I think that that's uh, so. In terms of the early the early thinking is all around food. When I went, you know, I went from being just a enthusiastic home cook and eater to doing it, you know, doing it in the paper. It's the terror. It's the terror of what if the recipe doesn't work. The terror of what if I get what if I say something at a restaurant that that no one agrees with, and I'm obviously I had a bad experience. So again, that comes down to that idea of that idea of you know you always want to be you always want to go back if you if it's surprisingly good or surprisingly bad. You always want to make sure your recipes are properly tested. You know, too many recipes out there aren't properly tested. That's the curse of so much stuff online that you know doesn't come from a respected source. Like you know, I, I write for Delicious and for Taste, and those recipes are all triple twisted. I know that. It, someone makes it it's gonna you know you may not you may not you, you may make it and not like the flavor because it's got dill in it or it's got coriander in it but you know what 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 you're being promised is what you're going to get so i think that those things quickly you learn that, that that stuff's really important the other thing i learned very quickly writing for when i started writing for the age no one in the paper had their email address at the end of their, their articles and i and i argued unsuccessfully at first but Maybe after about six months, I persuaded them to allow me to put my email address in, so that so that people, if they found and they had a favourite local restaurant, and you know, you know, Australians are, are so passionate about food, they eat out a lot, so they could they could they could tell me about their local place, and maybe I could maybe I could take it in, and 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 that that suddenly changed. You tend to find critics move in a very small circle of the of the same you know the same fifty restaurants. They all review the same places. Which, which doesn't really move things forward. I mean, social media, internet's hopefully changed that. Hopefully now you get someone who's obsessed with Palmer's just writing about Palmer's in Melbourne or Palmer's in Sydney, or, or someone who's just obsessed with just obsessed with stir fry or burgers, or you get you get these kind of specialists who you can who can give you some extra insight. But but I, I what that that having an email address allowed me to discover a lot of places, and they might have been you know. I mean, a Chinese restaurant in some outer suburb that no reviewer had ever been to, and they'd been there 17 years, and it was just delicious. And so, so I, I think that 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 was a that was a big learning about you know whether you're listening to data or whether you're talking to people. That that so that that stuff again, it's so valuable. It, it's it goes back to that Frederick Forsyth thing. You know, you never know where the next great idea comes from or where the next great recipe comes from. So talking about food is is a great joy and a, and a great inspiration the whole time. Could agree with on that one for sure. <laughs> now, the next segment, this one's called Starstruck Celebrities, one of my favourites, Matt. Now, yes, there's no oh doubt, my gosh. <laughs> there's no doubt you've met some very famous people over the years. Um, who was the most famous person you met, though, and why? And tell us about the story of that meeting. I must have been, I must have been nine, and I got to meet Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon. Oh. Um, and I have a, I have a, so you can imagine being a nine year old mean, and meeting the first man on the moon was like <laughs> almost, almost, but almost too big to contemplate, almost, almost too big to kind of to take in. But I've still got the photo. 
I still have the photo of me and my cousin, whose foot I was standing on when the photo was taken. He's in the back of the going, oh. <laughs> um, shaking hands with Neil Armstrong, which is that, 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 that's, that, I think it's pretty hard. It's pretty hard to top that. I know most people, I suppose as a journalist, you get to interview loads of people and, and you get very quickly, again, same thing. If you've done your research and, and you know some stuff about them that, that, that most people never ask them about, you automatically, you automatically kind of, you, you earn a little bit of a little bit of closeness that probably otherwise you wouldn't have, and that's important in terms of getting to tell you stuff. In nowadays, the people I kind of get freaked out about meeting, I've you know, I've had lots of mates in the music industry, so I met lots of people in that space. Food, less so. I still get a little bit, little bit freaked out meeting some 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 of those sporting legends. Looking back at your career on television, and also as a food critic and an author, there's not much you haven't done. What have been some of the highs and lows of your career? And sort of, do you have any regrets at all? Regrets, I have a few. Um, highs and lows. Oh, look, I, I think I mean the highs. The highs are the obvious ones, and and some of the unobvious ones. Obviously, the you know the the crazy success of MasterChef season one and two was was totally unheralded, unheralded, and um, and surprising. The i the idea of how they you know be able to go and launch a book in Portugal and and everyone know who you are in a in a country on the other side of the world is is really strange and very humbling and and also lots of fun because you people come up to you and say you've got to go to this restaurant i'm a fisherman all my best fish goes to, the, to this one chef it's really good and you go and it's really good that, that, that's the kind of the the, the upside I, I think i think the i think the scary stuff I, you know I, i've always taken an attitude i've always taken an attitude with tv that it's not what i do like what i do i'm a food writer <coughs> a food and restaurant writer that, that that's my job I've, you know, I've been writing for Delicious for 20 years. Um, it's what I love. It's my happy place. It's the thing I, and I, I just adore going down those rabbit holes, coming up with ideas. I still get buzz coming at the end of it because we've come up with a with a column idea that, that we think we both think is really funny. We're both laughing about it the next day. So, so, so in a way, when things happen, like we had season five of MasterChef, which which wasn't really, you know, we felt wasn't really a, a show that that we were that proud of, you know, that we didn't, the, the cooking wasn't good enough and it sort of lost its way a bit for a year that, that, and, and the ratings, the ratings suffered accordingly. And you get that sense of, of, you know, slipping out the back door, which I think is for lots of TV people, you know, we all have a, we all have a limited shelf life and there's that, that can, there's a, a terror for lots of people that, you know, it's going to be it. That's going to be it. But, but for me, it's always been the sense with TV is that I get to go back to doing what I love. And, and that's the food writing. And if anything, you know, and, and again, travel as well, you know, write about travel. So, you know, I haven't, not just through COVID, but before that, I haven't really, you know, done the three big international trips I would have done. I've not, you know, I used to go to, I used to go to say Istanbul, Seoul and Buenos Aires in the same year to do food stories. That's, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to eclipse that as a job. It's really the dream job. I think in terms of the other stuff, the other, the other failure stuff, I, I kind of think you, I kind of think you, you 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 feel depressed about it, and then you go, "Well, what can I learn from it?" I like that. I like that. I do a bit of radio now, and I had a great interview with a with a, with a philosopher who's who's big into stoicism. And and it, then the first question he said you should ask yourself about failure is, "How can I impact? Is it is this in my control? If it's in your control, then you can change. If it's not in your control, then don't stress about it. You know, if, if you decide to put out a if you decide to put out a a, a, a video on TikTok and no one cares and no one watches it. That's all right. You move on. You do the next thing. It's a bit like playing golf. You know, <laughs> the hardest thing with golf is forgetting about the last terrible shot you made and moving on because at the end of the day, you know, that's the only way you're gonna you're gonna gonna improve. So, ab other abject failures. I'm trying to think. I've been very lucky. I think. I mean, maybe that's just because people set their expectations very low with me in terms of regrets. I'll do those very quickly. Not buying a 1964 Ford Galaxy convertible bright pink white bench seats from a friend, my friend Matt, who was we wanted to sell it for 500 pounds. That was a huge mistake. <laughs> um, not not buying a John Kelly painting when I went up to the the Benalla Biennale. John Kelly paints these amazing paintings of of cows, of of um, papi mache cows that were that were put on the runways in the Second World War up in Darwin to make spotter planes from the Japanese Air Force think that they were fields and not airfields. <laughs> I love his paintings. And the other one was being in walking past a, a giant 60 by 40 painting, the Madonna and Child, done by a, an indigenous artist called Robert Campbell Jr. that was available for 
I mean, it was quite expensive, it was 1,500 pounds, but I, I, you know, I loved it. I walked past it. I walked, don't think I walked past it once. I walked back past it again. <laughs> and I should, at that point, I should have gone back straight back home and, and said to my folks, I, I need, I need $1,500. There's something I have to get. Cause, and, but, but, they're, but they're my regrets. Everything else is pretty, you know. It's a weird thing. Whatever job you do, it's, you know, jobs and, jobs and partners, I've always found that, that when you read partner, your new partners invariably, you enjoy your life with them better than um, you did with your previous partner. That may be because you've improved as a human being. But I'm, I'm a big believer in, in, in you move forward rather than backwards. No, I like that. Great advice as well. Uh, and this segment is called Weird uh, but True. As part of your new book, Matt Petson's The World of Flavour, you've got a recipe, and I heard this the other day uh, doing a bit of research and, uh, and listening and watching some TV as well, Matt. You've got a recipe for making soft serve ice cream <laughs> with, oh, with chickpea yeah. water. Tell us more about yeah. that. <laughs> oh, well, that, that. You know, that, that, so that is, you, 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 you've, you've hit on the, in terms of, you know, in terms of things I'm really proud of, I'm really proud of that idea of, of being able to put frozen fruit into a blender and then um and then put in an egg white and turn it into instant ice cream that was really uh, i was that's one of my few original ideas i've come up with truly original ideas you know people used to put fruit in a blender and then blend it and freeze it and by using frozen fruit it happens instantly but the problem is that we you know everyone's got a bit concerned about raw eggs now and and again this is that lovely thing about about listening to people and being open to stuff i got a i got a text i got a I got a text sent to me by a woman in Calgary who watched MasterChef in Calgary and was following me on, on Instagram and, and was following my, my, my lockdown kitchen site on Instagram. And she said, have you ever thought of make, making your instant mayonnaise but using chickpea water? This is how I do it, and it works really well. I've had work with chickpea water before. You know, that's the liquid in, when you get when you cook chickpeas or that ends up in the tin of chickpeas. And, it, and I tried to make meringues and they were a disaster, but I... I followed a recipe and it was an amazing success. It was it was actually nicer, I think, than the raw egg one. And then recently I'm sitting there going, I'm going to make a video for TikTok. I want to make the instant ice cream. I wonder if the chickpea water works. And if you listen to the video, you can hear in my voice this kind of overexcited, oh my, like, oh, it's, it's, it's coming together. It's actually doing it. It's doing it. It's doing it. And it and again, you, you then, you know, it's a it's a blender, 300 grams of, um, of raspberries, Four tablespoons of, of the juice from chickpea. Raspberry's good because it's got a good strong flavour, so you lose any chickpea flavour. And a little bit of sugar if you need it, or honey to sweeten it. And you literally just press go on the blender, and you blend up. You blend up the the, the frozen fruit. You then throw in the chickpea water, and it'll just aerate. It'll just aerate, and you'll start looking pale pink, go from dark pink to pale pink, and it'll double in volume as it incorporates air. And suddenly you've got this beautiful soft serve that you can have, and you can do it with any any fruit, you know. You can do it with strawberries, you can do it with blackberries, you can do it with mango. The, I, I love those cheap, 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 hacky recipes that, that are a bit of fun. <laughs> That's magnificent. Um, and obviously, you've, you've been around the uh, food world for a number of years, as we spoke about. So what's on the topic of unusual foods, though? What are some of the most uh, surprising or strangest foods that you've actually experienced, Matt? You might have tasted or cooked and gone, wow, that actually tastes a lot better than what I thought. Along the same lines as the, uh, the, the, the chickpea water soft cream. Uh, soft serve yeah, ice cream. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a really, it's a really good question. Um, I think livers are always one of those things, you know, they look so weird and slimy and like blood red. And they're 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 delicious when they're when they're pan fried. I think I think sometimes I mean I always remember I was reviewing a Chinese restaurant and there were two desserts on the menu, and one was one was for a, a ginkgo bean soup, and the other was for a soup made with frog snow frog ovaries. The ovaries from a snow frog, like you know, what? in Hong Kong or somewhere. And so I order them. I order them. I order them both. And the ginkgo nut soup is disgusting. And bizarrely, the frog ovary soup tastes like instead of the, the, the ovaries taste a bit like sponge cake. And I was like, oh, this is really good. This is really good stuff. Often that's not the case. Often, you know, often when you you know you have a pig's lung soup or something like that in in Hong Kong, or or you you you, you luck out and have. You know, you, you're in a restaurant and you have a set menu, and they bring out you know, the Japanese restaurant on the sushi shimmy plate. There's a bit of whale, and you then feel you got to try it, and you try it because you, it's there, and it's not it's going to get thrown away. And you go, that's very underwhelming. I don't understand that. There's no, it's, there's no great flavour win there, and I, and I think that that's the thing. You know, I'm 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 happy to I'm happy to to take the moral consequences of eating pork because pig is to totally delicious, but if, if things are not totally delicious, if I can get the same deliciousness out of a vegetable, 
then, then, I, then I'd rather go the vegetable. No, I think you're, uh, I can certainly agree with you on that one. There's some beautiful vegetarian meals out there as well, even though I am a meat eater, but uh, I am trying to eat a yeah. bit more vegetarian, so I guess because my wife doesn't eat much meat as well. You sort of, you, you tend to change your, your patterns a little bit. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, I think financially uh, it's had an impact. I think people are just wanting to eat. I think we're also understanding that vegetables are not just the, you know, the boiled things on the side. That The old idea, I mean, I used to joke that, that you know, growing up in an Anglo-Celtic household, you know, vegetables are roasted on Sunday and over-boiled in the other six, six days of the week. <laughs> and there's so much we can do with them, steam them and fry them and, you know, puree them. They're, 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 an, endless world of, they're an endless world of pleasure. Well, last night I actually made just a basic oven roasted veggies uh, with some herbs and lemon and a um, few other bits and pieces. It's absolutely delicious. And it's just this so easy. You, this is you, Bebo. Bebo, you're writing recipes. I love it. it, it and, that, <laughs> and that's the thing. That's the thing. It's, you know, that's the magic of, 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 of cooking. Time and heat can change things beyond recognition. And, and that, that, that's that kind of crazy chemistry, transformation, metamorphosis stuff that, that makes it so much fun makes food so much fun and and it's it is you know it's 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 a science it's a chemistry experiment at home that you can eat i love that well matt preston the book is called the world of flavor it's your eighth book hopefully as i spoke before it's uh, going to be a bestseller like your other seven can't wait to have a read and uh, before you go tell us um, how we can purchase this great book oh you could you can you can go to any bookshop um or you can go to any bookseller online and you'll be able to find it if if you're watching bevo's show of course um overseas there's a great site called the Book Depository that will will ship it for free around the world. So if you want to buy it, buy it for your 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 mum your mum back in the UK or your girlfriend back in Canada. That that's that's the way to go with that. Um, but yeah, you, you should be able to find it stacked up high in in, in anywhere you go and going to find good books. Wonderful. Well, speaking of wonderful, Matt Preston, it's always a pleasure to to chat with you and look forward to speaking again in the future. Well done on the book and now well done on everything else you've done in your career so far. Lovely chat, lovely chat to you, Bebo. Thanks a lot. See you Pleasure. later. Bye-bye.